but just like everyone else in this session, I'm the last one, and that means I'm standing between you and your lunch, so we'll make it quick. Uh, so I'm going to talk about scholarly document information extraction. It's by our team in our machine learning group and uh, my group, which is our web information retrieval and natural language processing group. So I thought it'd be nice to have a picture of UT, so here it is. Uh, this is the Hodges Library, just a couple blocks from us, and of course it stores lots of library books and digital library collections, and uh, it's uh, appropriate because it looks like a mine. So we're going to mine uh, things like titles and offers some references uh, relating offer names to their affiliations. Those are the types of information extraction, things that we'd like to be able to do. Um, and so how do we do that? Uh, well, uh, very importantly, a lot of what you've heard about today already in the earlier uh, papers, it, you can see these things are crucial for uh, metadata extraction and building scholarly networks, uh, the duplication, etc. And the standard way which a lot of people do it is using a CRF. Uh, so this is a mathematical model uh, construct that represents a sequence of words. So for example, if we take part of the title, uh, and uh, reference information from the last paper is presented by Sarah, then you would have something like N. Jimmy Lin, 2015, identifying duplicate. Those are the words or observations. And what we want to be able to do is assign each of those words, sorry, let me use this, uh, with a label like offer. This is uh, obviously a date that's supposed to be here and the title. Okay? And uh, the it works really well. We use CRS for lots of different things in computer science technology, including object uh, uh, extraction. But it doesn't capture long-range non-adjacent dependencies, which is really common in scholarly information extraction. For example, here, uh, you can see the author uh, and the title are uh, separated by a field in between, date. And we don't have the way of representing that easily using a linear CRS. So I'm going to talk about our invention, uh, which is uh, basically uh, amalgamating two different things, which is a higher order semi-Markov uh, conditional random fields. That's a mouthful. So I'm just going to say that uh, there's basically two technologies that work. The higher order CRF, which is uh, capturing long range dependencies, and what's known as the semi-CRF, which uh, I'm sure some quite a number of you know, which is just to represent successive same type labels as a coherent segment. Okay, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Don't worry, I still have five more minutes. Okay, so uh, higher order of CRFs doesn't make a lot of sense. In Singapore, we like acronyms, so I'm going to make another acronym, H-O-S-C-R-F. That doesn't make it any easier to pronounce. But basically, what uh, it means is that we're going to introduce this idea that certain feature types like you've heard about today are what we call extensible. What we mean by extensible is that uh, they are computable incrementally. When you look at uh, a new observation, a new word, you can reuse computations from the old observation, and that makes it faster. Okay, and we're going to show that that fast, fast helps uh, uh, performance improvements on speed, and it also, because of the added modeling capability, improves performance. So here's the linear chain uh, CRF uh, for reference. And when we go to the semi-CRF, this is what it looks like. This is just a plain old semi-CRF that uh, Sunita uh, uh, wrote about in, I think, 2004. So basically what it means is we have uh, same type labels like offers, several tokens that represent an offer or date. They're all tied together, and we can make features over each of these segments. So I can say, how many words does a typical title have? How many words does a, a typical uh, offer have? Dates, years are usually just one. Okay. When we move to higher order semi-CRFs, uh, actually higher order is a separate innovation uh, done by other people. But when we meld them together, we get something like this, which means that we can represent constraints that are not just adjacencies, like between a title and a date, but offer also these longer range dependencies between an offer and a title, so over a longer distance. So this is really important, especially when you're doing something like natural language, where you have long distance dependencies in sentences, or even in this case where you're looking at a label that might represent a citation string. Okay? And it's actually a mathematical formalism. There are a couple formulas in our paper. I, I won't go over it here because we don't have enough time. But basically, what it means is we can model the conditional distribution over all possible segmentations at once. Uh, of course, that incurs, uh, incurs a lot of computations, and that's why it's important to try to optimize it, because otherwise this would be pretty intractable. Okay. 
So our key observation, if there's any takeaway from today, is that we are going to uh, segment certain types of features as extensible and some that are non-extensible. Uh, some features that we can compute incrementally are ones like bag of words features. So I'll give you an example of that. Let's say I'm looking at this current word duplicate. Okay? And I have in my feature inventory, a feature just, just says count the number of times that the word identifying appears in this prospective title field if it, the previous two fields were respectively offer and date. Okay? So that applies to this case here. In fact, in the last word, I found the word identifying, so that feature count is already one. Okay? When I move to this word, I don't want to recompute everything from scratch. I just want to use the result that I got from the last observation and just increment it. So in this case, duplicate is not the word identifying. Therefore, I can just reuse the last feature's value. Okay? So in fact, when we characterize features as extensible and non-extensible, something happens to the computational complexity that we have to work into the uh, inference algorithm. The good news is that most of the features that we are going to use are standard Unigram features. They are already in this extensible class, and we can uh, uh, use this uh, in an easy way to compute the current value of the field. The way we do that is to basically use the idea of memoization. So anyone who's done dynamic programming knows what this means. The edit distance, all of this relies on this idea of memoization, which means that we reuse the values from previous computations to help you with the current computations, right? So in standard uh, higher order CRFs or in semi-CRFs, the current algorithms don't uh, optimize for this. Uh, we have changed the uh, inference procedures for calculating the forward and backward variables, for marginal probability calculations, and for Viterbi decoding to do that. Okay, and um, this is the, the trick that happens. Basically, when we have extensible features, we can reuse previous computations, and the uh, computational complexity class drops from cubic to uh, quadratic for these extensible features. And as I had uh, hopefully convinced you earlier, most of the features that we use in, as information extraction professionals or feature engineering are extensible. So there's only a, a handful of features that are higher order Markov that don't obey this uh, complexity class. Okay, so enough about that. Does it help? Okay, well actually you could use higher order semi-CRF uh, uh, already. The problem is it becomes pretty complex because a jump from quadratic to con uh, cubic represents a big haul. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, data sets that we use. Uh, the free tasks that I introduced at the beginning, they're the same free tasks that we're going to use in our experiments. And the data sets are available, they're online, and just like a, as in the first talk, uh, those data sets are available, you can use them for any of these tasks. Okay, so reference string parsing. Uh, this is the idea of reference string parsing. Basically, you have a paper. At the end of the paper, you have a bunch of references. They're in string format. You want to know what fields they are. So MLite is an author's name. 2001 is a year. So you can automatically extract metadata doing this. Okay, there have been a lot of previous work published on this. Uh, one of the state-of-the-art methods uh, is using a linear chain CRF. And you can see here that um, the first column represents that. Uh, if we look at micro average F1 score, which means basically that larger classes like offers and book titles um, and titles, those are you know, what every publication has to have. Those will count more in this uh, micro average F1. Uh, they're going to do better. So overall, you can see at the bottom, um, uh, I don't know whether you can see the bottom or not, there is a significant improvement that doesn't look like much. From 94 to 94.35 doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're dealing with only errors of about 6%, that turns out to be pretty significant. Um, for generic section labeling, we're doing a task like this. So this is when you have already pre-identified in a scholarly paper headers. Okay. So each section header there might be one called related work, one called resources, and we want to categorize them to generic sections like evaluation or methodology. This is really helpful, let's say, if you wanted to pull out several papers, evaluation <coughs> section, and then be able to 
uh, create a survey paper of which paper uh, which technique does what. Okay, uh, when we look at this type of evaluation, uh, again our data set size uh, works uh, to train uh, a small amount of data. Okay, and we can see actually this uh, particular task benefited the most from longer range. Uh, modeling of the second order CRF, that means when we model not just the adjacent dependencies, but one additional, just like I showed you in the first slide. So you can see quite a big jump here of a one percentage point, uh, sorry about that, on the bottom, and that's very significant given that we're only dealing with errors of about two or three percent in total. Finally, offer an affiliation extraction. This actually turns out to be a pretty hard problem. So there's actually three tasks in this, which is to first extract the offer and the affiliation from the title page of an article because of the very wide variety of differences in the way people uh, represent offers and affiliation. This turns out to be a pretty difficult task as compared to doing the reference string parsing where you extract the offers and affiliation uh, offers information from the end of the uh, article. Okay, and uh, there's another task that we're not showing here that doesn't rely on something like a CRF that does the matching between them. Okay, and uh, here we don't see that much improvement, actually very little improvement, because the scale of our testing and training data that we have that's publicly available is pretty small. Okay, and as promised, because it's close to lunchtime, I want to just speed up my talk and talk about speed ups. Okay, so um, there's three different uh, tasks that we are doing here, one, two, and three. And you can see the one with the generic section labeling doesn't seem to uh, benefit a lot from extensibility. Uh, that's because of the feature inventory uh, we have on there is actually fairly small, and uh, there aren't that many Unigram features uh, that figure into that task. So that's why uh, you don't see that much performance speed ups. Okay. So it's a short paper, so I'm going to conclude. We introduced the notion of extensible features in this paper. Uh, basically, the trick here is to use memoized computations as uh, pre-computed results from previous observations. And that allows us to change the uh, cubic complexity down to quadratic time complexity. And it makes uh, this algorithm tractable. Uh, we are currently uh, implementing this into our Parsit uh, uh, information extraction system, which a number of systems use, including SiteSeries X has used it before, as well as Mendeley. So if you've used any of those systems, you used some of our research before. Okay, so thanks very much for listening, and enjoy your lunch. Maybe a question, two. Just a quick question. I uh, was just wondering for the author affiliation extraction for the more difficult problem. You were extracting that from what? From the PDF? From some OCR version of it? Yes, from the PDF, from OCR PDF. So in the OCR PDF, we have information about font size, spatial location, X and Y coordinates on the page. That is given to us through OmniPage, which is the nuanced uh, OCR engine that we run over the, the PDF. We have a, a, a corrupted version of our system that runs on uh, text. So if you run PDF to text, and you get out this representation, we can also do it, but of course the performance is not nearly as good. And, and the sample was across uh, journals, uh, articles from different journals, for example, not just from one. Yes, very much so. So uh, that's one of the uh, reasons why this data set is pretty important for this, the two extraction tasks, is we look at a wide variety of journals, so especially humanities, and I think especially high energy physics, we have a really big problem when we have tons of offers, you know, hundreds of offers on one paper. So uh, there are some from each of these uh, different sectors, and that's from previous work that we published that data set. But that's a great question. Maybe there was some last question here. Okay. Um, some of the improvement over uh, just vanilla linear CRF seems to be less than 1%, or sometimes it's in that range. How much slower is it compared to just vanilla linear CRF? And if, uh, if you need to do because the difference is very small, would it be helpful to do some uh, significant testing? Just because maybe it's just this data set that we're seeing this improvement. That's a, that's a great question. That's a caveat of our system is that running higher order semi-CRS is a lot slower than linear chain CRS because of the computational complexity. Um, we've made it more tractable. What we're going to do in incorporating it into our uh, open source software is to only run it for um, 
extraction problems where we feel that the confidence level of the linear chain CRF is low. Okay, when the system is a little bit confused, then we're going to give it a little bit more firepower to do the, the disambiguation with respect to the sequence labeling. We won't run it for uh, sequences where the CRF is, the linear chain basic CRF is pretty convinced that it works well. Yeah. Right, again, again, for the sake of time, let me stop here, please, and uh, uh, thank you, Minya. Please join me in uh, thanking all our speakers. I thought it was a great session.